This is Ink on the Brain, Teaching Print in a Post-Print World, Part 3. I'm Todd Duran, Professor of Graphic Design at Spring Hill College. You can find out more information about me, my design courses, and my students at designmylife.org. Print was a system for disseminating text that brought about change, leading to reform and even revolution. Printing contributed to the Reformation by exacerbating a problem and then disseminating ideas for reform. Printing reproduced indulgences to be sold to raise money for the church, a practice that Martin Luther viewed as sinful and exploitive. Luther's reaction was his 95 Theses, nailed to the church door in Wittenberg in 1517. But it was the printing of Luther's theses by Melchior Lauder in 1522 that widely disseminated his ideas. By 1530, there were estimated to be 2,200 printings of Luther's works. But even as, printing, as printed books gained market share, there was a resistance to the new technology. Rich and influential Italians who could afford to bought manuscript books and often had interest in the scriptoria and protected those interests. Printed books were seen as cheap copies by some, including the Medici, whose libraries in Florence contained only handwritten manuscripts. Even the Hungarian king Matthias Corvinus assembled his entire humanist library from manuscripts produced by Italian scribes and illuminators. Seen as expensive status symbols by some, Books were sometimes banned and even destroyed. The Dominican friar Giralmo Savaronola was made the leader of Florence after the invasion of Francis King Charles IX the, the in 1494. After thundering sermons condemning lavish lifestyles, Savaronola's followers piled fine furniture, clothes, and art in the public square, setting them alight in what they call bonfires of the vanities. The biggest was held in 1497, when allegedly Savaronola threw in several Botticelli paintings himself. Later that year, a Florentine riot grew into a rebellion, and Savaronola was deposed. After all, he'd been brought to power by an invading king, and the Italians had grown tired of his fire and brimstone. Savaronola was excommunicated, arrested, and tortured until he confessed, the standard jurisprudence of the day. Finally, on May 23, 1498, Savaronola was burned at the stake in the same plaza where he had conducted his bonfires. By 1559, the Vatican was losing its battle against the reformers supporting Luther and Calvin. That year, the Roman book printer Antonio Blado printed Index Librorium Prohibitorium, the official papal book listing banned authors, including Martin Luther. Even as the Jesuits, with their contemporary reputation for intellectual freedom, suppressed Reformation texts, book burning and censorship took a heavy toll on the book business during that time, even ruining the famed book fairs of Frankfurt. By the end of the 15th century, printed books were clearly the future for European scholars, and while printed books would not replace manuscript books for another century, they were reaching new markets and a new generation of readers with growing religious, scholarly, and social importance. For five and a half centuries, printed books have been the best way to take a journey through the world of ideas. Books remain the most effective way to understand and absorb complicated ideas, rich narratives, and, dare I say it, deep thoughts. Gutenberg's revolution must still be defended, heralding reform, advocating new ideas, and keeping language alive. Besides connecting us to ancient Rome, Venetian type also connects us to the calligraphic roots of typography. It has always been held in high esteem by type designers who have created timeless faces to ins inspired by Jensen and Griffo. Bruce Rogers' centaur carries the Robert Bringhurst seal of approval and its lithe italic strokes ending in asymmetrical end in asymmetrical serifs. Palatino by Herman Zapp is also a Venetian face and is used in this in the self-published version of this paper. It's buttoned down 1950s vintage belying its Renaissance roots. Fred Gowdy's Berkeley Old Style also has the slanted E of a Venetian typeface. 
It was originally designed under the name Californian in 1938 for the University of California Press. Tribute is a sturdier Venetian-inspired face that stands up well at small sizes. Designed in 2003 by German type designer Frank Hein, Tribute is sold by Immigre. Jean-Francois Porches at Polonais received a Morisawa Award in 1993, its roughness giving the face a more lively feel. In 1994, Tobias Frere Jones completed High Tower for the Journal of AIGA. With the Q's dramatic tail and the slanted E, High Tower looks as if it's been struck from Jensen's own punches. Contemporary Dutch designer Jos Bovinga became popular with this modern slab serif with his modern slab serif font Musio. But he has recently turned his attention to Venetian influences as well. Coluna is listed as Venetian and Giralde and has a serif that's bracketed on one side only. While Jensen's and Griffo's work is over half a millennium old, the, the calligraphic qualities of these digital types show influences with a distinctly Venetian style. Book printing has become part of our vocabulary. When we're feeling off, we say we are out of sorts. A person with nothing to hide is an open book. When someone is trying to change, we say they're turning over a new leaf. An unimportant event is a footnote. And watching the details of anything is minding your P's and Q's. All of these phrases come out of the rich culture of print. And as we Google our way into this new millennium, perhaps we should pause, remove our hats, and show proper respect for the favored intellectual medium of past centuries. 15th century Venetian printing made scholarship possible. Ancient texts were saved, modern editions were standardized and cited, and literary works were reproduced in their original language. But how is this relevant for us as designers and educators today? The rich traditions of early printing hold important keys to relevance, scholarship, and aesthetics. To keep our work relevant, let's read more and read more in print to unlock the deeper knowledge that's in books. To keep our work scholarly, we should do more than simply Google sources for writing and research. Students should be reading more widely and deeply than they often are. And finally, our aesthetics should reconnect us with our cultural roots. So let's look to the past for inspiration, even as we move toward the next big technology. Because as creative communicators, we strive not just to deliver a message, but to create relevance, generate excitement, and engage scholarship. Even now, as printed books are threatened by ebooks, we cannot escape the language of print. We have ink in our brains. And this concludes the lecture.